an ongoing series that we have. In fact, I see a couple people on that the names are starting to get recognizable. Uh, there's a few amount on air and, I, and I'd love to see the repeat people to join us here. Um, you know, the cockroach hour is something that we've been doing uh, recently it allows us to basically get some, some really deep information out of our team into your heads uh, and, and, and to help people think through some problems they may have either database related or not. Um, I think a lot of the concepts that we try to attack here are some are basic, some are more advanced, but I think there's some of the, 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 the challenges that people have as they, they move towards, you know, distributed systems and microservices and, you know, cloud native topologies and architectures and whatnot. And so today we want to talk about the database. We want to talk about, um, you know, well, it's near and dear to our hearts here at Cockroach Labs. Um, and while, you know, database topology is kind of the, the what that we're going to talk about, it's really about, you know, how do we add physical geography uh, to a database schema so that, that we can actually start to, you know, survive things and, and provide low latency access to data and that whatnot. And so this is stuff that we live here uh, every day uh, at Cockroach Labs, uh, and we're excited to talk about it. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to have a little bit of housekeeping. Um, Please do ask us questions. We are happy to uh, engage. Uh, th these sessions, again, are meant to be more interactive than anything. We aren't going to have slides. In fact, I think we're just going to use some of our docs today uh, to actually talk through a couple of key things. we got some great people on. Um, we, I do like the chat, actually. Uh, you know, QA is great. Chat's even better to me. Uh, I know there's a couple of uh, Cockroach Labs people and some other people who have actually implemented uh, these things that I'm seeing on the line here. And so feel free to interact with everybody on the chat. And then of course, definitely a, a recording will be available after the event. I know uh, JP is on the line today uh, is great about getting that follow up email out to y'all. So you have a copy of that if you want to share it. Um, you know, this is everything's available on our YouTube channel, uh, all of these that we have done as well. Um, and, and I would highly recommend reviewing some of the, the older cockroach hours. We've, we've done some really wonderful things. I, I quite like the one about transactions, honestly. So, so with that, uh, let's say, okay, today's session, oops, no, I'm not done yet. Stop it slides. Um, so today's session um, is a little bit more advanced. It's, I wouldn't say it's a beginner level thing, but there's some stuff we're going to talk through today. We're going to talk about raft. Um, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, some, some key areas about geo partitioning and some other things. It looks like I did not update these slides. I'm sorry, everybody. What I didn't update that actually is still true is the best questions will get swag. So um, JP is listening and heavy to, to look at all the questions we get and do that. So I, I would like to introduce uh, our panelists now. So it, Jesse and Tim, if you would like to come on screen, that would be great. There he is, Jesse and Tim Vale. I love it. So I am, I am wildly excited to, to have uh, these two individuals with us. You know, Tim, you have been on this before with me before. Uh, and so just do you want to explain what your role is here at Cockroach Labs? Yeah, hey, uh, glad to be here again. I head up the sales engineering team here at Cockroach Labs. But as you know, Jim, I'm in a weird spot today. Yes, I know. In the middle of a move. I've got the world's worst internet connection. I'm a 43-year-old man in my parents' basement. <laughs> so hopefully... Um, you know, you'll hear me okay, and we'll be able to do this, uh, this just fine like we have in the past. But is, it, today's going to be a weird one for me. Just don't start one. yelling, Mom, meatloaf. I mean, you're on yeah. the couch there, you know? So yeah. uh, that's good, dude. Welcome. We'll do our best. Yeah, you don't have to explain to anybody that that's what you have on your walls. That's cool. Um, and then, you know, Jesse, I'm really happy to have you on. Uh, you know, I don't think there's a session that passes, a webinar, cockroach hour, whatever, where I don't talk about, um, you know, the documentation here at Cockroach Labs. And, and if anybody who has been on before with us uh, has heard me go on and on and, and just, you know, praise our documentation, I think everybody, this is the person here that uh, that has helped driven that. So Jesse, I, I, I kind of just gave up what you do, but you want to explain kind of yeah. what you work on here at Cockroach Labs. That's super kind. Um, I, I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm happy to join uh, these two, Jim and uh, and Tim. Um, and I can't, I can't claim full credit for the documentation or the quality of it. There's a, a great team that, that, that I work with and they collaborate very deeply with um, with uh, Tim's team uh, and uh, other teams that have uh, just incredible depth of knowledge about our product and how it's used. So I do run the, 
um, run the um, the education team, and so we we have a bunch of great writers writing the documentation and some some curriculum developers building out um, uh, self-paced free uh, online courses at Cockroach University. Um, so I'm really yeah. excited to be here with you too. Yeah, and you know, I I just look at y'all. Our documentation is second to none. Tim and I joke about this all the time. I, we come from the kind of the Hadoop space. We were together at a company, and man, we always laughed. Like you know, wow. But uh, seriously, if you if you're thinking about you know using Cockroach Labs, we're going to actually use the, our documentation as a backdrop to have this conversation today. So, um, with that, guys, I did want to actually let's just get out of slides and let's let's get us talking so that we are kind of the the force or the the threesome with with JP in the background there. So um, what we want to talk about today is database topologies and how we actually can overlay, you know, you got to think about location of data. When you, when you get to distributed systems, I think people generally have thought about database design and think about schema. You know, they think about a table, the, the DDL is all about that, right? And I think when you get into distributed systems and you start thinking differently and that, that paradigm shift, shift happens, location becomes a really big deal for for lots of different reasons um you know i think latency and how quickly you can access the data but i think more importantly and more readily apparent to most is what you want to survive right and 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 resilience right and so that's what we're going to talk about today and and how you can actually configure a cockroach database to, to help you with those things but tim i wanted to start with you um just to get us going what's your famous question you ask every customer uh, I've heard well, you, you already how many said times. It. You already like said it. Uh, which is, and it, it really does begin with this, I think. It's an, and it's an important kind of distinction about um, what Cockroach can do and does. Um, and that's, that is, what is it you want to survive? Um, that's, that's really an interesting question that, that other systems have a difficult time answering. You know, I think one of the key points that you made here is, you know, yes, Cockroach is a distributed database. Well, what does that mean? And we'll spend a lot of time talking about it, I suppose. But I think that the reason why topologies become important in Cockroach is that when we stay distributed, what we mean is that the database can span, you know, a wide physical geography. It can span multiple what we call failure domains or things that can fail. That's and right. this is an incredibly important kind of um, value proposition ultimately for Cockroach. And so, you know, one of the questions that we have that we can ask that others can't is like, when you're building this database topology, when you're building a solution based on Cockroach, what do you want your database to survive? And I think the key notion at the end of that statement, if I may, Jim, is survival for us isn't some, you know, meager existence, right? Survival means what do you want to happen to your database and continue to serve reads and writes without interruption. That's, right. that's survival. That's real survival for us. That's right. Um, and so, you know, and that, I think that's kind of the premise for what we'll talk about today is what are the different ways you can configure Cockroach so that you can continue to serve reads and writes even or while significant failures are occurring, either planned or unplanned. That's right. And I think you said something there that's actually pretty important, Tim. It's reads and writes. Um, you know, this isn't, you know, we're, we, you know, I think you can have distributed storage like a AWS Aurora and you can survive outage of a disk. That's fine. Uh, if your write node goes down, you're, you're, we're talking about, you know, survival across all the capabilities of the database itself, which I think is, it's one of those nuances, I think, in distributed systems for sure, that becomes really, really important. Like every, every, you know, I, I think one of the coolest things about CockroachDB is that every node is a consistent gateway to the entirety of the database, right? And Tim, you and I talk about a lot of, about that too. What does that mean as well? I mean, it's from an availability point of view, right? You what does distributed mean? Yeah, no, just just the, the, the every node being a, a, a gateway. Uh-oh, uh, oh, I'm thinking, uh-oh. Am I losing you in the basement here? Is, the, is, the, is everybody on TikTok upstairs? <laughs> <laughs> I said no TikTok for the next hour. <laughs> um, yeah, your question dropped off, so maybe punt it to Jesse, and I'll I'll catch you on the next question. Yeah, go ahead, Jesse. So I think I think what you were asking is, you know, this notion that um, you know a, a CockroachDB cluster is comprised of however many nodes, uh, individual machines that are all joined together uh, into into a system that from the outside uh, seems monolithic. Um, and that can, like Tim was saying, it can span all kinds of different failure um, sort of domains, a single, single, you know, uh, availability zone, 
multiple availabilities, once in a region, multiple regions. Um, and, and what you were asking was, I think, around this notion that like everything is symmetrical. So That's right. the node is, uh, we have this notion of the gateway node, the, the node that receives a request from a, from a client, you know, you know, through a load balance or whatever. Um, it doesn't matter what node uh, it is that the request lands on. It does matter actually in practice uh, to reduce latency, but it, any node can handle any request. That's in, right. It, you know, technically, it'll cockroach. It just knows where to route the request. Knows how to coordinate. Um, uh, you know that work um, automatically behind the scenes. Bye, Tim. So we just. It's basically you and I now, buddy. Um, All right. so <laughs> Maybe he'll jump back in at some point. Yeah, you know, he will. So, so I, and I think it's actually a really important point. I, and I know like you and I actually didn't talk about this before the session when we were talking about flow, but I think it's actually a pretty important part when you start thinking about survivability and topology itself. Like I think, look, there's the database and what we can configure internally, but ultimately people are basically setting up a load balancer in front of us, right? And, and I think that's another layer of kind yeah. of the accessibility and it kind of works in the survivability story, right, Jesse? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, in a distributed system like ours and, and many others, you, you definitely want to be leveraging mm -hmm. um, all of your resources, you, right. you know, and so, so from that perspective, a load balancer is, is key, but um, you don't, your application in principle doesn't have to know um, any, you know, very much about the location of right. data. And yeah. therefore, you can just sort of balance load, sort of you know, uh, in a round rab robin fashion, and um, and again, Cockroach will, will do the right thing. Right. Yeah. And it isn't like you're scaling and sharding a database, and the application layer needs to know where to go with which connection string, or like you have some shim that's doing that. The, the database just deals with it. And I think just yeah. starting there and actually understanding that the database is smart enough to deal with these things, to me, is the the beginning of this conversation, if you will, right? And I, I like to think about, you know, our customers and how they deploy. I'll, I'll jump in for the, some of the stuff I would have talked to Tim about, but, you know, like I think, you know, we get asked about architectures and how to implement and yeah, the, that load balancer is actually a pretty big deal. But what Jesse said in terms of like, yeah, just round robin across a bunch of nodes in a single, in a single AZ, you have five, six nodes, just round robin all the, the transactions because I tell you what, the database knows where to find that data. And if data is written in triplicate, and your replicas are set to four or five. Oh, I'm sorry, never four, right, Jesse? Uh, we got to do quorum here. Oh, we'll talk about wrapped in a second. Um, you know, the database is going to handle that, and and it is smart enough to know where that data is located. Uh, and I right. think that, that's what we're going to talk about today. So, absolutely. And and this is a bit of a foreshadow, but where you know, in a single region, it's really simple. Um, but we'll we'll get to like when you when your when your application is running across multiple regions, you have customers all over the place. Um, that's, that's where, um, it is important to think about, um, you know, where the request is coming from right. and where the data lives in order to, uh, mitigate the, the, you know, the time it takes to travel over a wire to, you know, a totally different geography. Yeah, that's um, right. Yeah. So, so let's, let's get into that, Jesse. And, but, but just one last thing before we get into topologies and show people diagrams and everything, there's this concept called raft within cockroach database and it's we, we've just talked a little bit about replicas but I think we need to explain what replicas are their importance in the database and what a leaseholder is because we're actually going to talk about that right and if anybody hasn't studied raft I've said this before in cockroach hours in the past you know don't do it now maybe afterwards uh, you know google raft uh, as, a, as a distributed consensus protocol and, and really dive in but Jesse like just in a like a I don't know, the best way a docs guy can. I mean, you know, you're a poet as well here. Um, how do you explain RAP to people in, in, in the context of what we're okay. doing? Yeah. Um, okay, so RAFT is, uh, we're using RAFT um, to basically uh, ensure that we're always, uh, that, that uh, you know, to ensure that uh, data is always uh, consistent. That's right. Um, and so I think before talking about RAFT, it's helpful to understand you know, how data is really stored in CockroachDB because RAF comes into play here. So, you know, uh, under the hood, you know, obviously everything looks like SQL, SQL tables, or database yeah, and tables. Indexes. And we're wire compatible with Postgres. It's just SQL to the end user. It's just, right. it's yeah. just SQL. But uh, sort of at a lower level, what's happening is 
um, that data is, um, is sort of stored as a giant sorted key value um, uh, map. And that map is broken into what we call ranges. Um, and the range is a really important um, concept because the range is what gets replicated. And so for, by default, I think um, Jim alluded to this, like each range, let's just assume that a single table, uh, it's a relatively small table, it just maps to a single range. Now that range by default gets, um, gets replicated three times. Um, and so what Raft um, you know, um, ensures is that whenever there's a write um, to that table, to that range, a majority of those replicas are going to agree um, before that change is committed. Um, and so Raft is really, really essential for ensuring um, consistency of, of rights. Um, and uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a basic explanation of it. I mean, we yeah. could walk through, Jim, I, don't, I, I wonder see, if you- Yeah, you know, we have, uh, you know, if, if anybody wants a more deeper explanation, or more deeper, did I just do that? Did I just really say more deeper? If anybody wants a deeper uh, explanation of, of Raft and how we use it, there is an, the architecture of a distributed database is the webinar where we definitely go into that. But it's really yeah. important, I think, you know, distributed consensus is what that does. And it's, yes, it mm -hmm. helps us do this to ensure that transactions are gonna be consistent because we have quorum rights, right? So two of three of the ranges have to be, or the, the replicas of that range have to be updated. That's how we get that. But it also helps us distribute data. It, it, you know, this, this whole KV layer and how we actually set up ranges, think of them as kind of how we shard and scale as well. It, it mm -hmm. is, once I figured out primary keys and, and how the keys are set up in KV, Jesse, holy wow, man, cockroach made a whole lot of sense to me, right? Um, yep. But but Raft is is the key thing, and it, and it is allow it does allow us to control where data gets written in 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 a cluster as well, which is yeah, it's, it's definitely helping with the transactions, but it is a key thing as well at, at that layer too. So, yeah, um, for sure, I'm not even going to ask him. I, you know what? The guy leaves and then he goes off camp. Are you still with us, buddy? Just so I know, I want to bring you back in. I'm here. Look, okay. I, I'm not having a great day, as you know. <laughs> the computer decided to reboot mid-webinar. Never had that happen. And it's back, but the video won't turn on. So here yes. I am, audio only. Um, but I am here for you, Jim. I'm here for you, Jesse. That's Just awesome. Keep so what I'd like to do then is, um, Jesse, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually bring up docs. And, and we, we, you know, the concept here is we wanted to actually talk through some things here. So I am going to share screen. Jesse, you can see uh, I'm just on our website, right? Yep. Yeah, cool. Awesome. So what I'm going to do, y'all, is, is we want to actually talk through a couple things here. And so just our docs are, are off of our main bar. So just come into our docs. And then we have this thing called topology patterns, which, you know, I always, it's, I know exactly where it is. It's part of our deployment. Uh, and that's what we want to talk about through today. So. Um, there's a couple of different patterns in which we, we, we think about. I think there's three archetypes. Um, Jesse, just can you just explain single, multi, and anti-patterns? It's just the highest level before we dive in. Yeah, sure. I, I can't see the screen you're sharing. You I just can. want to make sure that Tim and, other, and the audience can, though. I cannot. Tim, you cannot. Man, what, okay. what was I sharing? Nothing. It was a black screen. What about now? There we go. Okay. Okay. Um, awesome. Yeah, so topology patterns, um, what we're really talking about here, it's, it's really what Jim uh, um, has been talking about all along. It's really like how, you know, you have the shape of your cluster. Um, you know, are you deployed in a single region, you know, in, you know, across multiple availability zones, you've deployed across multiple regions. Um, and that's kind of the general cluster topology. And then, and then there's, I, I almost call it a, the data topology. It's thinking about where are you going to where is data located um, across that cluster, across those nodes? And so for, for single region, um, there's actually, you know, we have a development pattern we don't need to look at. It's really just spin up a single node or, you know, however many nodes you want in a single region. You're just, you just want to actually use the database and, and develop against it. Survivability is not as Jesse, important. I think at one point on that is like, you can download the binary today and run it and use it as a database as a single node and develop against it. It's not an emulator. Yeah. It's not like it is like any other experience, a node and it's the yeah. database, right? So I think it's a pretty Absolutely. important point. So 
because it's the full capability. Every binary is the same thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and there's, and there's really, really easy ways to do that now. I mean, this, this pattern sort of suggests running a node in like a single VM somewhere, but like you said, just download it to your machine. Um, there's even a built-in command that I think I'm sure has been covered here in the past called cockroach demo. You have the binary, you just run cockroach demo and it, it spins up a cluster in memory on your machine with a SQL shell immediately open. Yeah. Um, so you, there's, there's that you could spin up a local, you know, single node cluster, multi node cluster. It's really, really easy. Um, and that's, and that's in the binary that you download uh, yeah. or in cockroach cloud, whatever you want. Um, Cockroach demo packet packages applications. It packages benchmarks. It, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there, and I think there's there's a lot of uh, documentation on what's there as well within our docs as well. So we won't get too deep into yep. that, but but it's all there. Yeah, for sure. But then once you're once you actually have a real deployment, you know, uh, let's say you actually are going to run something in production, the basic production uh, um, pattern for a single region is is not very complicated. Um, because there's really these there's uh, these these two main dimensions we talked about like you know latency and resiliency. Um, first to talk about latency, you don't need to do anything in a single region because uh, you know latency between nodes in a region or between AZs in a region is sub millisecond, and uh, mm -hmm. you don't need to control the location data um, in a single region. Um, uh, what you do have to think about even in a single region is what do you want to fail? You know what do you want to survive? Like like uh, like Tim mentioned, and that's all about what we call the replication factor. Um, you know, how many times are you replicating uh, data? You know, whether that's all data in your cluster, or whether that's a specific table, or whether that's all tables in the database. We have some pretty flexible controls for you to be able to do that. Um, and and so um, I think the most important thing to remember in a single region deployment, Jim, if you if you click basic production there. Yep. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Sorry. I was just, I was, I was tending the chat. No problem. And then if you scroll down to the configuration section, there's a little diagram there. Yep. So really, I mean, this is a very naive diagram, but it's just saying you have a single region at the bare minimum, you want three nodes um, because that's where you get the benefit of raft, the benefit of our, you know, uh, how we replicate, you know, how we, um, we, we can survive failure. Um, and you want three nodes. Um, and if you're going to have multiple nodes in a region, you might as well spread them across AZs. It doesn't add cost. And then you have an additional um, failure domain. So okay. in this case, you have, let's say, you know, you have three nodes, they're spread across three AZs, you lose one node, your cluster continues um, uninterrupted, um, because you all you have, you have a majority of, of replicas still available in the other, the other uh, nodes. Uh, if you had multiple, let's say you had six nodes, nine nodes, and they were also equally distributed across those AZs, you could lose an entire AZ, uh, you know, in this configuration because you still have two of three AZs left, uh, which means that because everything's evenly um, distributed uh, without doing anything special, um, you're going to be able to survive that. So in a single region, um, it's really all about what you want to survive. Um, right. And, and Jesse, I mean, you're talking really at like, you're talking at the table level right now. I mean, we do this all the way down to the row level as well, right? I mean, you could do it at the database level, right? Like, yep. and, and so there's kind of three different ways of thinking about this. I think the, what you're talking about right now is just an entire, like the table level, like, but, but yeah. you can get as granular as want. We're going to go there, right? So. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I think that that's right. Like Cockroach Core lets you control replication at um, at a bunch of levels, like you said, you could control it at the at the database level. So all tables and indexes within that database inherit some replication factor, or you could define it for a specific table right. for a specific index, I believe, uh, in the core version. And um, and but like you said, there there we do have the ability to control um, uh, replication um, and other things and location at the row level, and that and and that's where we get into multi-region scenarios. That's okay. where it's really important to be able to do it at the row level um, when you when your geography um, uh, increases. So, so does it make sense to jump off there? I think so. And Tim, yeah. unless you have, yeah, 
Okay. Yeah. Tim, did you want to add anything there? I think no, I think, uh, you know, there's a really interesting question, which I, I tried to write an answer to, but probably misspelled half the words and the rest of the sentences didn't make sense. So maybe as we get into the multi-region pattern, we, I can attempt to kind of answer the, the question that was, that was so nicely um, written to us. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I don't have a comment about this, but I, but I, I think I might, might get into this next one. Yeah, I, and this is the stuff that really interests me, Jesse, right? It's like, look at, I've got a database that's running in, you know, three parts of the world and I can, like, I can survive the, the east coast of the United States falling into the ocean. Uh, and talk yeah. about, you know, the, you know, the, our name, the cockroach, uh, you know, this yeah. is where, this, this is where things get pretty interesting, I think, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and um, what, what, what also is really cool about cockroach is that, you know, when you're, when you're deployed across multiple regions, you, you have to, then you have the opportunity to really think about your data in a more, um, in a more specific way. You know, then you get to think about, okay, well, what's the right. nature of this table? Like, mm -hmm. what kind of data is in this table? What are, what are my requirements for the data in this table? Like, how, how fast do I want reads? To be on this data, how fast do I want rights to be on this data, um, and and it's actually really important to ask those questions when you're deployed across multiple regions, because with cockroach, when you ask those questions, then we have these topology patterns that you can apply to get exactly what you what you need. That's right, um, and, yeah. and 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 just like in the in the single region, you're still gaining the automation of scale, right? You're still getting this resilient nature of the database and. You know, I, I think there's a lot of value in, in deploying us in a single region. But a lot of customers do that, right? And yeah, it's it's the here where it gets interesting in terms of like where you locate that data because you could start to with latency and and these larger kind of survival zones, if you will. You know, Jim and Jesse, it might be kind of interesting. I, maybe this is everybody knows this, but I, you know, it might be interesting just to kind of discuss like why would you want a multi-region deployment? Because I think you make it a really key point, like. You know, it's super easy to deploy single region and that works just fine. You, right. know, you know, people could look at this and say, well, geez, you know, I don't, I, I'm not big enough. I, I don't need, I don't need to span regions. But, but the reality is there's a lot of good reasons why you might want to do this, whether you're a small startup or whether you're like some of the world's largest companies, right? And I think it might be That's right. you know, just off the top of my head, right? I mean, I can, I can think of a couple, I, I'll let you guys jump in, but you know, one of them is, that's a really good question, Tim. So, Tim, why would yeah. somebody want to go multi-region? Yeah. Why would? Why? <laughs> well, so I, I think there's a couple different reasons, right? One is is clearly the resilience, right? If you are worried about um, a, a region going down, if you're deployed in the cloud, a public cloud provider, and you're worried about regional stability, and it deploying happens. an application across multiple regions um, makes a lot of sense. One of the things you know we don't often talk about in this context, but you know, everything that, that we're sharing here applies to public cloud providers as well as private data centers, right? And so, you know, you could think about this topology in the sense that, you know, I as a company operate three physical data centers, you know, and right now two of those are sitting idle or many of those are sitting idle. And I want to I want to deploy my database across all of those data centers, right? And utilize at a higher degree all of the hardware and infrastructure that I have deployed that for the most part is sitting idle. And, and so this, you know, this can be a, a resilience thing, a utilization thing, but it can also be a performance thing. I just, you know, edge computing is starting to take over the world. Lots of people are pushing, you know, compute out to the edge. Well, it would be a shame if your compute's sitting out on the edge, but your database is centralized. Pushing data to the edge along with compute can really speed up performance. Uh, so there, right. you know, that's some other reason. And then, you know, there's this, we're not talking about it here, um, and it's not specifically a multi-region thing, but you know, having options uh, when it comes to providers. You know, maybe I don't want to put have all regions in cloud provider A. I want to have a mix of cloud provider A and B or C. And um, this kind of configuration allows you to do that. And I think that's one of the key things to consider here is the fundamental building blocks of Cockroach enable us to do some really creative topologies that can be single region, but can be this kind of very diverse infrastructure. Well, Tim, I think, you know, you just said something that I think is, a, you nuance something. We're talking about a single logical database deployed physically across multiple clouds. And 
yeah. I think that's really interesting. Now, typically where this happens is like in the hybrid deployment where you have a little bit on-prem, you have some stuff in a public cloud. We can do that today. And, and, and we have customers that are doing that sort of thing today. To me, that's just unheard of. Uh, I mean, you may have an instance of a database that's running in multiple different cloud providers, that, but it is a single database. And I think this constant, this, this, we started with this conversation about a gateway. Mm -hmm. Any gateway, no matter what, it can, has access to everything. As long as those nodes are connected, we're good. Now, last thing on this, and, and I know, I don't know, I, I always got to come back to Kubernetes somehow. If you have, you know, disparate Kubernetes clusters, instead of federating Kubernetes clusters, getting a single control plane all, across all of them, why not just do that at the data layer, right? And so you can kind of think of that in the same way. But let's let's actually jump into kind of how this works too. So Jesse, I want to bring back into, let, let's get back into the weeds, right? Mm -hmm. Tim, you're bringing us all the way up there like that. Um, so let's talk about yeah. geo-partition replicas. You know, let's talk sure. about leaseholders, that sort of stuff, Jesse. Okay, yeah. Oh, that, that, that was incredibly important context. Um, I think that, you know, to come back to this point that like you really look at your data and think about what, what's the nature of this table. Let's just look at a piece of, you know, like a table, the information in the table. Um, you know, when you're in a multi-region scenario, you want to do that. And like, and there's, there's some basic, you know, characteristics. So like if, if this data, is this data sort somehow can it be tied to geography? For example, let's say you have a user's table and you have users in a bunch of different countries. Um, so maybe one of the columns identifies um, that country. Um, then the rows in that table are essentially, you know, implicitly tied to geography. Um, and in that case in particular, when you have data that can be tied to geography that you want to be, uh, that would, you know, you'd, you'd benefit from being close um, uh, or being located in that geography, that's when you use something like geopartitioning. And um, there's really two patterns here, uh, but the first one is the full-blown geopartitioning, where you say, let's say you have, again, that user's table. Um, and if you, let's see, let's see if the, the visual will help here. So let's say, let's imagine that, yeah, we have these three, you know, we're deployed across three uh, US regions, nine nodes, evenly distributed across all, all, all AZs. Jesse, um, it's too bad three. we don't have our, our best example of this. You and I always talk about Germany. And hey, German data's yeah. gotta live in Germany. Yeah, How you do that. Yeah. Right? You could think exactly. about that here too. Yeah, it's perfect. For sure. Yeah, like everything I'm saying about this pattern in particular applies to uh, domicile and data. Yeah, That's right, for yeah. sure. Um, so if you if you scroll down a little bit, um, let's see the configuration part here. Okay, well, yeah, we are that's starting important. the node, and we're naming each node, yeah. right? And I think that's the that's a key thing. You have to actually name each node to where it's located, right? Yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, that that is important. When you when you um, deploy with Cockroach Cloud, for example, it's just doing that automatically. But Cockroach, as long as when you're starting a node, you pass there's a flag called locality, and you use that locality flag to describe the location of that node. In this case, we're just saying, and it can be as many layers as levels as you want. In this case, it's just US West and, and the specific zone. Um, and then the database cockroach then has information about where that node is located. Um, and, and so, you know, in, in this, this diagram, what it's showing you is like each, each color is a, is, is a range, is, you know, the three replicas of a range. Um, and as opposed to what I was saying before in a single region, let's say you have one range for the whole table, um, what what geo partitioning what partitioning lets you do is basically split the table into multiple ranges. Uh oh. Uh oh. Am I going to have to do all this explanation? Uh, a technical thing. Users table, and and you have a whole, whole bunch of. Uh oh. Wow, and here we thought I was going to be the problem. No, and I thought you were the, oh, great. Now I'm going to have to Chicago. do this, Tim. You all still there? Yeah, we are still there, Jesse. You just, you were. Am I back? Yeah, you know, this is the, uh, the, the C19 times we live in, everybody working from home. Maybe uh, just go off video for a minute, Jess. I love the freeze frame, though, because he's about, it's, it's very serious pose he's in right now. Yeah. Oh, we, did we lose him? Okay. Oh. Hey, Jesse, you're back. All right. I'm back. I'm sorry yeah, about that. Yes, no worries, um, no worries. I mean, we just basically had named nodes. Yeah. Uh, you know, with, with locale, and then basically yep. you were talking about replicas and how they are then placed. That's right. Yeah. So, 
so really the, the the idea here is that like you know you can instead of instead of you know sort of thinking the whole table is the unit of replication um you can partition that table into different groupings and you know typically by geography so let's say again there's a bunch of users with you know assigned to chicago and a bunch of users with new york and a bunch in la um you can tell cockroach hey i want you to partition this table um, by geography like that. And then so all of the data for all of the rows um, for users in Chicago, all the rows for users in New York, um, they are in distinct ranges. And then you can control that. So what you see here is, um, and there are the steps below can go into this. The mechanics aren't really, aren't, aren't complicated, but you basically tell Cockroach partition the data like this. And then you say, okay, now we have these partitions. Now locate all of the replicas for this partition, let's say the New York partition on nodes um, with the, you know, in the US East region. And if you remember when you start the node, you tell, you, you define the locality. And so uh, Cockroach says, okay, you want me to locate the data for New York partition on nodes in US, uh, US East? Which nodes are in US East? Let's right. Put it all there. And that's what you, that's what you hear. And the key here is that um, when you do that, if you scroll down, I hope I'm not going too fast here, but if you scroll down to um, the latency section, I think this is the key for full geo partitioning, which is geo partition replicas. If you go all the way down to the latency right range, here. Um, yeah. So for so this is an example where let's say you have a, a request coming into your you know from in Chicago, um, and you know you have your clients running there, you have a load balancer there load balancer nodes to point to one of the nodes in that region, any of them can be gateways. Um, then it's going to route that request to the right range and specifically to the leaseholder, which we didn't talk about. When, when you have multiple replicas, um, one of the replicas has a special status. Um, for Raft, it's called the leader um, and all requests go to the leader and then the leader coordinates consensus, um, but it's also almost always the leaseholder and the leaseholder, the leaseholder is actually where all requests, reads and writes go to. Um, and so for reads, it just goes to the leaseholder and then it comes back to the gateway and it goes back to the client. And the fact that everything um, is in a single region makes it super, super fast. You get this benefit with the next pattern, geo replicate, uh, replicated um, geo partition leaseholders. But yeah. if you scroll down to rights, that's where it really benefits you um, because and this is animated and it might not come, come across, but essentially consensus can be achieved without leaving the region um, because of you fully uh, uh, partitioned uh, the data. All the replicas for a partition have been pinned to that region, which means that Raft doesn't need to leave that region to get consensus. You know, the different uh, coordination from the, the leader to the, to the followers all happens in a single region. So you essentially get single region performance um, uh, in, in this case, um, in a, in a multi-region cluster. So that's, so really for, for full geo partitioning, this is amazing if you want really fast reads, but also importantly, really fast writes. Yeah. That, just, just, you, maybe you might, you might want to turn off video. You, you cut out a little bit. I mean, you're, you're fine now, but it might, it might help a little bit, but I think one of the key things too, Jesse is to talk about is like, as you were talking and, and like this diagram does, you know, a request is coming from a client into a load balancer into any one of the nodes. That could have happened anywhere. That could have happened through the, you know, the load balancer out west. And like the database is smart enough to actually understand when I hit one of the gateway nodes, it's like, oh, the leaseholder for that, that central piece of data is over in the central. That entire That's transaction right. is still happening in central, right? And, and it's just going to return that request back to whoever asked, right? That's absolutely right. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's amazing because let's say that you, let's say that you have, and the next section is really about um, resiliency, but to your point, like, let's say that all of the, um, you know, I don't know, look, th this is hypothetical. Let's say like, like this whole, the whole region, all the data, all the AZs where your data lives, it goes down in one of the regions and your client request comes in. If the load balancer is configured to sort of, you know, fall or fail over to a different region, like you said, uh, the nodes can handle that. That's but right. um, but with with this full geo partitioning approach, um, you know, ideally your requests are are in the same region where your data lives because that's where you get 
the the fastest reads and writes. Um, but the one trade off here, um, or it's a significant trade off, is it's about what you want to survive. And when, like for a partition, because now the data is really at the partition level. Uh, it's not it's not the data the the table level. It's the partition level. Remember the New York partition. Um, in this case, you know that data, the New York partition, that uh, the data in the New York partition. It, um, it's, it remains available as long as a majority is available, which means that in this case, you can lose an entire AZ and still have a majority. You can lose a node, obviously, but an entire AZ. But you can't lose more than that. If you lose more than that, you lose consensus on that data. And that particular um, partition, the data in that partition is no longer available. The rest that's of the right. database, the rest of the partitions are still available. And that's right, Jesse. And depending on what you want to survive, you would then configure it differently so that maybe there is a copy of that data in another region. So you still have that. And I, I think that's one of the things yeah. about that cockroach. We get a lot, we always get a lot of, you know, I always get that question. Well, well, I'll we'll have all the data in one place. And what if that one, all the replicas go away? Well, yeah, that, that data is going to be unavailable, but that's why you have to think about the physical deployment of the data itself when you're thinking yep. through cockroach, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and, and, and the, 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 you know, the next pattern geo partition leaseholders, we almost don't even have to look at it because you understand the concept now. I think it's really, you do the same thing. Um, but you know, you partition the data in the same way. Let's say you have a table that again, the rows right. can be partitioned by geography. It's the same idea. Um, and you tell the database, you know, cut up this table into these partitions. What the, 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 the main difference here is that, then you tell Cockroach, but I only really want to make sure the leaseholder, the, the, the replica um, that is the leaseholder, I want to make sure that one is in the right geography. That's right. The rest, the rest of them can still be distributed across all the other regions. And, right. and this is, this is great, a great way to get really, really fast reads. But of course, writes to get consensus, that means you incur that kind of cross-region network latency. Right. Um, and then, and then yeah. you can survive better as well, right? I mean, that's the, I think, a key piece of that, correct? Absolutely. You can survive better. Um, and that's, that's, that's a real, that's why I think this is particularly interesting to most people. Um, so writes are, are, are slower, but like you said, you know, because only, let's say, that, let's just use the New York partition again. Let's say that this entire region goes down, U.S. East. Well, only the leaseholder of the New York partition was, was pinned there. The other two replicas are still in U.S. West and U.S. Central, so that partition is still available. You can you can uh, tolerate an entire region going down in this scenario. Right, and this is where Raft comes in. Raft is a as a protocol. If y'all read about it, Raft basically maintains that if I set my my replication factor to three, and one of the replicas goes away, and if you think about a replica of a range, just basically like. like all the records in the table from Walker to Zitnitsky, right? Like this, like you just order everything or all the, you know what I mean? Like it's basically a part of a table that's in range. And as long as I yep. have basically two of three of those, I can get quorum across that, the, the replicas, right? That's how we guarantee yep. transactions. More importantly, if I only have two and it takes them a certain, I forget what the, the timeout is, Jesse, but if I only have two replicas, the, the database is smart enough to understand I'm, I'm, I'm under replicated on that range, which means like I got I to gotta create another copy somewhere because I, I need to make sure that I have three replicas at all times. And Raft is, is really what allows us, to, we, we kind of get, get that from Raft, right? And I think yeah. that, that's what would play out here. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great point because we weren't talking about like how we recover from these failure scenarios right. in a very automated way, like you said. So like, this with this picture, let's just imagine that one AZ disappears, and right so here, right? yeah, yeah. Well, let's see, let's even say like make it simpler, and not not the whole region, but like just one of those AZs. Uh, let's see, yeah, you at East three. The, so right. those two, those two um, sort of ranges, ranges yeah. the purple and the pink, they're underreplicated now. They have two. Each of them have two replicas in the other regions, and like you said, cockroach is gonna is gonna detect that, and after a certain amount of time, it's five minutes by default. It's gonna say okay. Well, we need another replica. That's Do we right. have a place where this data can actually uh, live based on the rules that you defined? And so if those other two AZs in that US East region are still available, it's just going to create new replicas there. 
It's just um, awesome. I, I don't like your use of color because I'm colorblind. Yet, Jesse, but sorry yeah. about that. <laughs> we need the design team to help us out with this. I know, right? But yeah. but it's 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 just this this level of automation for not just scaling because we can actually write it all to ensure that you have access to it, but like the automation of all this resilience is just phenomenal. Um, because I guess yeah. how would you have done that in a big single monolithic database? You know, you'd have you know a, an a, you know active passive and failover and you know it, it's none of that comes into play. Everything's active. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm just seeing that there's a few good relevant questions in the Q&A and we could awesome. probably just jump on right now. There's one, uh, one attendee is asking about uh, geopartitioning. Do we lose resiliency at the region level? If we have failure on an entire region, then all localized data are not available. Yes. So I think you might have asked that before we, we, we covered it. But yeah, that's the trade-off you get with full geopartitioning, with geopartition replicas, all of the replicas for a partitioner in a geo, uh, in a region. And so if you lose that region, yeah, there are, that particular partition is, is unavailable. Right. Um, and that is, that is, uh, that's a decision. Um, that's a decision. You know, but it's yeah. up to you to think through that when you're designing the database. That's why the name of this, this webinar is like applying location to your schema, right? Yep. I mean, that's everything, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and then um, Hen Henrique um, asked about the leaseholder, geopartition leaseholder pattern. And he asks, uh, you know, do we also ensure that the, the replicas are forced to other regions? So, so when you, when you, so we pin the leaseholder for a partition to a, to the, to a region. We want to make sure the leaseholder is always, always available kind of locally um, for, for requests. Um, the, what happens to the other replicas is up to you. If you do nothing, um, then Cockroach is going to balance those other two across the other regions. So you're going to put one in each of the other two regions. Um, but you could control that, to your point. Um, this is all done with a feature we call, um, uh, there's a few names, you know, zone configurations is the way that it's really referred to in, in, at our SQL level. Um, yeah, so let's see, they're in the steps. Is it here, Jesse, or is it, it, it is. here? It is. Um, and maybe while you're scrolling up, can I just make a, a quick point? Because uh, I think it's a really, and, and I know you guys have, have both made it, but I think it's, it's an important point to hammer home which is, you know, we're talking about some pretty sophisticated knobs and dials that allow you to be, build kind of increasingly complex topologies in order to survive or, or perform under a whole bunch of different um, situations. But it, it's, it's important to note that you don't have to do these things. And Cockroach, no. Jesse kind of indicated, you know, Cockroach is going to use a number of heuristics and other things to, to place data around the cluster, regardless of, of kind of the topology of the cluster in an efficient man manner in order to, um, you know, survive the right kinds of things. So I, I think one thing, it's, it's really clear to, to, to just kind of go back to is what we're walking you through here, kind of increasingly complex ways to tune the cluster, but by no means do you have to start this way or is this the only way in which you can leverage cockroach? Um, yeah. You know, this is for pretty sophisticated stuff. Yeah, that's a really good point. And, and it's, it, it, it's, it's so fundamental how Cockroach DB just automates that by default, like you said. Right. Um, it really is. And we, I'm glad you brought us back to it. Um, Cockroach really, it does, if you do nothing, it will basically do the right thing and it'll balance everything out. So you get the maximum survivability by default. Um, and, and to Tim's point, yeah, these are, these are really two, these are ways to tune and get, uh, you know, you know, faster writes, faster reads, um, you know, different, different levels of survivability for different tables. Well, and That's Jesse, absolutely but, right. And, and while we're, you know, we're at about five minutes left and I did want to cover one last thing on this. Um, you know, the beauty part about it, like Tim said, deploy cockroach, get it up and running. And then you can think about these things. And by the way, you can make all these changes in production. Right. And, and with online schema changes in production, you, you know, data starts moving around, you change, you know, you alter zone configurations like we're looking at. Right. Um, and it's just really simple DML to, to, and everything changes in the back end. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. I mean, cockroach just lets you change, uh, change table schemas and define these rules, these zone configurations on the fly. And then it just reacts. 
um, right. to whatever rules you put in place. And that's right. The cool thing. The cool thing is with 20.1, we didn't really cover it, but if you do go to multi-region and you do want to leverage some of these, the geo partitioning um, uh, patterns in particular, then that's, then you have to think about um, there's aspects of your table schema that are important. And it's particularly the primary key. The primary key has to, has to, you know, has to include that geography column. That's uh, right. But um, in before 20.1, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, honestly possible to go from a simple table schema in a single region to a table schema that is, um, that is, uh, you know, applicable to geo partitioning in a multi region case. And now you can do it um, on the fly. There's, you know, there's SQL commands that let you transform the primary key of a table um, uh, while, while, you know, the table is online and lets you kind of re reconfigure the schema. Um, so that you can scale into a, into multiple regions and then apply a, a pattern that will um, give you the right performance. That's right. So I did want to, there's a couple of things actually that there's a bunch of really good stuff in the QA y'all and we're not going to get to all of it, but we will answer all this stuff. There's a couple that are just really awesome. I'm going to throw a really easy one out there for you, Jesse, um, because I know I, my friend Andy Woods would love me to talk about follower reads on a, um, on a, on this as well. So can you just talk about follower reads and what that pattern is and why that's important for our customers? Yeah, yeah. Follower reads is a really cool feature. So um, we talked about, you know, how Raft works a little bit. And then you have like multiple replicas comprising a range. And one of those replicas has a special status, um, you know, as the leader or the leaseholder. Um, and normally, as I mentioned, all requests go to that one replica that, that has that special status. Um, with follower reads, what, you, what you're able to do is say, no, I actually want to bypass that. I want to go to one of the follower replicas. I don't want the request to be routed, always routed to, to, the, to the leader. Um, I want it to be, go to the nearest follower. Um, and, uh, and this is really powerful. And it, what, what, it, what it means though is you ha it, it's, it's a slightly historical read. And uh, as right. of 20.1, it's, uh, it's 4.8 seconds, I believe. <laughs> um, it's pretty, it's pretty subtle. Um, and so for, for strictly transactional, uh, you know, reads, for example, you wouldn't want to do that. You might not want to do that, but for a lot of use cases, um, follow reads lets you get really, really fast, um, That's reads right. without, without really having to mess with, um, with very much of anything. Um, you just have to use a certain syntax to say, tell CockroachDB, I want it, this to be a follower read. That's right. Yeah, and I think it's a, it was a key feature that we had actually introduced uh, earlier this year. And what is it, 4.8 seconds now? I, you know, I don't know a whole lot of tables that are less than that, but that's, that's pretty awesome. And it, but it comes down to like, look at certain tables, you need, you know, instant serializable isolation, guaranteed transactions with no, like, and no delays and that, we do that, but also to relax a little bit from the file read point of view, allow you to, you know, extend that out so that, that people can optimize for performance in those sort of situations as well, right? So, yeah. Um, hey, Jim, I know we got, a, we got a couple questions. I was going to try and you, try and answer. I was going to try and do some of them live. Do you want, how do you want to do this? Because I know you said yeah, we only have a few minutes. No, go ahead, Tim, please ask. Um, I mean, maybe first and foremost, you know, anonymous attendee is kind of a little concerning to me because he's wanting to nuke everything. Um, <laughs> so a lot of nuking happening, but I, I do think it's important um, to, to talk about what happens um, kind of under, you know, uh, kind of large scenarios. So I think what's, you know, one of the, the questions was kind of, hey, I, if I've got three data centers and God forbid two of them get nuked, right. uh, what happens? Well, what happens is there's a, a, a lot of a lot of bad things are happening in the world um, and and we probably should be focused on them but but secondly it's important here to understand that that we are a quorum based system or a consensus based system and if if you want to survive two data center failures regardless of how they are destroyed you need to have um, in this case five data centers available right because That's I have right. to on the other side of the failure what remains must be a majority of the total. So Cockroach is not built to survive a situation in which two of three are destroyed. But it would be if you were fundamentally concerned about losing two of something, 
you would need to have five in total. And that really applies kind of regardless. So Tim, does that change if you change the replication factor though? Because we're talking yeah. about the default replication of three, right? Like what if I had right. the replication up to five? Th that's right. So we always need, you know, you can, I, and I can't remember the, the formula, but essentially you can survive more by increasing the replication factor. That's right. Right? So if I, if I have a replication factor of three, I can survive the loss of one. If I have a, right. a replication factor of, a five, I can survive the loss of two. Um, and, and the kind of the, the list goes on and on. And, and I think maybe this is an important thing to consider and we don't have a lot of time to spend on it obviously, but you know, we oftentimes spend a lot of time talking about cap theorem and what does that mean, right? And, and one of the things you must consider about cockroach or remember about cockroach for as much as we talk about availability and resilience, we are actually a CP system, meaning we will stop forward progress and maintain consistency in the form uh, in the face of network partitioning, and thus sacrifice availability. Um, in in the two out of three data center, what you're in effect asking of the system is for it to be uh, an AP system. I'm going to sacrifice consistency in order to serve or maintain availability, and that's, that's something right. you don't want to do. Yeah. Um, the the last thing I'll just quickly um, quickly mention is. Uh, and I like this anonymous attendee. He's he's all over it. Um, <laughs> you know, we often get a lot of questions about the largest deployment size. And and you had mentioned this kind of in passing that you and I both come from a big data um, perspective or, or um, history. And so I'm so used to thinking that large means data size, right? And and I, I guess maybe one of the things I wanted to call out here, j just as a reminder about cockroach, is cockroach is really an OLTP transactional processing systems, something, a, a system focused on, on those heavy read-write OLTP workloads. We're not necessarily the world's best OLAP or analytics engine. So, you know, I'm not sure what the ask here is and, and under which metric uh, they're interested in understanding size, but, you know, we're, we're a transactional system. So generally, our data volumes aren't going to be in the petabytes of size, right? Because most transactional systems aren't operating on that amount of data. If it's about node size, well, sure, we can get up into hundreds of nodes. Uh, but but you just uh, wanted to kind of remind yeah, it, the group that this is really a, a transactional read-write system. Yeah, and Tim, it's, it's hundreds of nodes uh, distributed across the entire planet. But I think, yeah. I think of size too. I just don't think of like just the, the, the size of the database in terms of the volume. I, I think of the volume of transactions as well. Like, being able to scale up transactions is also very important in certain situations too. Like say you're an online e-commerce and some horrible pandemic hits and all of a sudden your traffic goes up by three to 10 fold and you have a single write node using another, that's a, that's a nightmare. Like you, you basically lose customers because you can't handle that volume. Whereas if you can actually scale both reads and writes and scale the amount of, you know, the storage side of it, the size of the database, if they, there's a couple of different vectors we think about, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the other thing is, you know, there's a, a Jason Keller out there in the world who's been asking some fabulous questions. And I feel bad that I I, I, we haven't I know. Really kind of like, okay, Jason, if you're out there and you're still listening, you send me a message on LinkedIn or some other mechanism. We'll get to these because there's a lot to unpack. Um, and I don't know that we have time here, but oh, um, we will answer all the questions. We will yeah. actually send out answers to everything. So, but, but Tim's email is Tim, Tim at cockroachlabs.com. No, it's TV. Oh, that's right. Your TV. That's right. So, uh, but happy, happy to take questions offline because these are these are great and important questions. Some of them are just harder to harder to answer in this forum than than I like. It is. It is. And, and these are complex topics too. I mean, we we really scratch the surface, guys. You want to bring your video back on just to to to, to do our our going away. We are two minutes sure. past the hour, so. Um, we will answer all the questions that we got in chat and in the QA um, post event. Um, I did want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, you know, most importantly, my, my, my two guests, uh, Jesse and Tim, you guys, I love working with both of you. And it's, I, I, I hope it showed on this, uh, this event for the audience. I think we have, a, 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 I like our, I like our conversation style. So, but um, I thank everybody for joining. Um, I thank you for all the questions, especially anonymous attendee who wanted to nuke everything. Tim's favorite, <laughs> favorite question maker. Um, but, but seriously, thank you everybody for taking time today. I know time is valuable. Um, we appreciate it. Um, you can go out and try all of this stuff today. 
Um, you know, you go download Cockroach, um, Cockroach DB, the core is, is available for free. Cockroach Cloud gets spin up a cluster in, in, in minutes. It, it'll be running for you. Um, but I, I will, I will, while we all Jesse's on the phone, I end every, every one of our, our sessions, Jesse, talking about our docs. Go to our docs. If you want to learn something about anything that we talked about, pretty much, Jesse's handed me like, oh, Tim, you want to talk about replication factor? Here's the link. All of these things are in our docs and, and they're very eloquently um, explained and very simple. Uh, you know, you got to understand some core concepts. So understanding, you know, some of the tutorials around our architecture and stuff is usually a good place to start. But there's some really good stuff. And then also Cockroach Demo, which is embedded in each of, in the binary itself, is a great way to use Cockroach DB as well. Um, you know, spin up a cluster, but have an app and a workload going in seconds. That That's pretty awesome stuff. So, guys, you want to say goodbye? Yeah. Thank you so much, Jim. Tim, it was a pleasure. Yeah, great um, as always. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, Thank you all very much for joining. And uh, again, Tim and Jesse, we'll see you soon. And uh, everybody have a great day. All right. Bye. Okay.